Turn your Bibles, if you would, to James. James. We're going to be looking at James for a couple of weeks. And uh, I think it's appropriate because of the times that we're living in. Um, I just don't want us to be ill-equipped as we face uh, various trials, of which there are many. I know that you probably are aware that uh, we have another run of COVID going through the church, but I don't see you people wearing masks, some, and I'm just, it's here, okay? It's here. COVID's here. And we need to be sensitive to one another, and we need to be praying for one another, but the truth of the matter is, it's here. And so as we face these trials, and some, some of you I know are facing the loss of your jobs um, due to vac- vaccinations and your stand on vaccinations, and as we've said so often from the pulpit, we are neither anti nor for vaxes. Um, you do what God leads you to do, and we will be supportive of you in that. It's the same with masking. It's the same with social distancing. So um, let's just... Continue to love one another and remember that the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts that we might be able to love one another. We have that love present. So let's do that. Well, the days are coming and actually have always been present when believers' faith will be and has been tested. When we come into seasons in our Christian life where the bottom seems to literally fall out and all around us, doesn't seem to make sense. And when confusing and frustrating situations develop and sadness threatens to overwhelm your soul, that's when it's time to turn to James chapter 1. James chapter 1 is a mainstay for us as believers when we face these kinds of times. James was the brother of Jesus, and he penned this letter to Jewish Christians, actually, in the very early days of the church, understood to be the first epistle written in the New Testament. It was penned sometime between 47 and 49 A.D. That's very early. Most of Paul's epistles are 60 and so forth. It predates the council in Jerusalem, Acts 15. You remember that council where Paul went to uh, promote the salvation of Gentiles, and it was actually decided there that Gentiles indeed had received the Spirit of God, just as uh, the disciples did on the day of Pentecost. And so, obviously, God was doing something new and miraculous in bringing Gentiles into the body of Christ. He is recognized as a pillar of the church, Galatians 2.9, as well as his role as leading the Jerusalem Council in chapter 15 of Acts. He emphasized the importance of a practical, living, everyday faith. And in doing this, he stressed the importance of good works being a manifestation of saving faith. Faith without works is dead. That's what James wrote. He offers concrete counsel on many issues to confront believers with the everyday troubles that we face in every age. How do you face the trials? How do you deal with poverty? Or how do you deal with riches as a believer? What prayer looks like in a believer's life? And how do you deal with physical illness? And so many more practical issues are in the book of James, probably one of the most practical books in the New Testament. Today I'd like to investigate just the first couple of verses in chapter 1 and James' teaching on the testing of faith the testing of faith. He clearly addresses everyone's secret fear, adversity. (laughs) We're Americans, come on. We've kind of, just like we're trying to stamp out COVID once and for all, we've tried to stamp out adversity once and for all. But it still lingers. Webster uh, defines adversity as a state or instance of serious or continued difficulty or misfortune. And as I said, when you face a state or instance of serious continued difficulty or misfortune, turn to James chapter 1. 
In fact, James is so audacious as to advise his readers to consider it all joy when you hit times like this. Why would he say that? That's like wishing somebody to have a happy root canal, right? I mean, it seems counterintuitive. Rejoice. Consider it all joy when you fall into various trials. Let's read James chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus to the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad. Greetings. Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. But the brother of humble circumstances is to glorify, is to glory in his high position. And the rich man is to glory in his humiliation, because like flowering grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass, and its flower falls off, and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So too the rich man, in the midst of his pursuits, will fade away. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. I'd like to talk to you today about a number of things, but first let me give you a quick overview. James immediately gets into his theme of his whole letter in verse 3 where he says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces something, the testing of your faith. Faith is central to the Christian life, and it is the way it begins, and it is the way it is to be lived out until we see with our eyes and no longer have to depend on faith. It's the only energizing principle of the Christian life. But faith is more than mere profession. Because saving faith is a living, active faith that proves that it is alive by what it does. And there's possibility no greater arena to see living, enduring faith than when adversity strikes. That's where faith really comes a lie. So to begin with, James shows that the living faith shows itself in reaction as it has when it's under attack. If you've got living faith, you will see it demonstrated when you suffer adversity, when you are tried. The adversity that James focuses on first is the trials that a believer faces in life. And he says there are various trials. They point to testing faith but with a specific end in mind, meaning that the test will, in the end, show the quality of that which is being tested, the faith. It will show you the quality of your faith and the character of the one under the attack. Okay? Testing is a word that is usually, it, it's neutral, can mean either a negative thing or a positive thing, and the connotation comes through the context. Sometimes it's translated temptation, as in Matthew 26, 41, or 2 Peter 2, 9. Even down in verse 13 of this, it says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. The idea there is temptation to evil. But here... In the verses that I read to you, James is doing something different. He has a different thing in mind, and it's a testing through trouble caused by hardship and problems and difficulties. It's a testing. It's not a temptation. In our frail human experience, too often the trials turn into temptation. They don't have to, but they do. 
because of our own inner response to the testing. James addressed both sides of this testing in the following sections of this first chapter. And you can take this as a little bit of overview, just backdrop for you as we go into James chapter 1. Uh, first, in verses 2 through 4, you have the right attitude in trials. Secondly, in verses 5 through 8, you have the part that prayer, prayer plays in trials. In 9 through 11, you have the right position to be standing in. In verse 12, the outcome is endurance. Okay? And then temptation is its source. It gets, you, you get the source and process in verses 13 through 17. And finally, we see in verse 18 where it all begins is with regeneration. You know, when I was first saved, I thought, everything's going to be great. <laughs> I had such peace and I was so filled with joy. I might have had something to do with what a rascal I was before I was saved, but I was really, really filled with joy, and it took me by shock when the testing of my faith finally came. I'll be honest with you. I mean, I had struggles with temptation to sin, obviously, but it wasn't until about year two that I sensed a difference. There was a wrinkle in the, in the source, you know. The force was doing something different. Up until that time, I had such joy and such a sense of God's presence. And I woke up one morning, I was doing my devotions, and I didn't sense his presence. Well, to coin a phrase, it freaked me out. I went to a teacher, I was in Bible school at that time, and I told him about it, and he took me to Psalm 27. And he said, you need to read the last verses of Psalm 27. Don't depend on your feelings, depend on God's word. And trust that he is real in your life. Your faith is being tested. That was the first time it was like two years into my salvation, can you imagine? But there have been many times since then that such things have come about, and you cannot rely on your emotions during times like that. You have to go directly to God's Word. And so that's what we want to do, because God does test the faith of His people, but He does not tempt them to do evil. That's important to realize as we go through these verses in the next couple of weeks. God does test the faith of His people, but He does not tempt them to evil. Okay? So let's talk about the right attitude in trials in verses 2 through 4. It says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. He starts right off, consider. And the very first thing James does is he gives a command. That consider sounds kind of soft. It sounds like if you, if you want to go ahead and consider this. That's not what the Greek is behind it. It's a command. It's in the imperative. To consider means to regard, and it means to come to a settled conviction after a deliberate mental evaluation. There's something taking place here. It's not just through osmosis. You don't just kind of sit back and, and let things happen to you. This is active. You've evaluated your situation, and after you've evaluated the situation, you consider it all joy because it's a command to do so. And humanly speaking, our first response to trial is not joy. This is counterintuitive. I'm, I'm being struck more and more in my old age now with how spiritual the Christian life is. <laughs> Takes a long time sometimes, right? But you know, I think people live a lot of their Christian life just based on their emotions and not on the Word of God. And not on a supernatural power that raised Christ from the dead that lives within us, the Holy Spirit. But the Christian life is supernatural. It's spiritual, not carnal, not fleshly. So our volition, our will comes into play whenever we face trials. One commentator said it like this, quote, it is to assume a conscious acceptance of a definite inner attitude. So you evaluate your trial, the situation that you're in, and then you consciously choose to consider it all joy when you're in that situation. The verb consider, it's an aorist. 
and it's an imperative. And it conveys a sense of urgency. James gave them the command to adopt a specific mental attitude toward the trial after specific consideration. The heiress means that James wanted them to adopt that attitude once and for all as their consistent response toward trials. So from that time on, in my experience in Bible school, I began to adopt an attitude of trusting that I would see him in the land of the living. Even though I felt like I was in a land of the dead. Because the emotions weren't what was matter. What mattered was, did I believe God's word? And he said he saved me. And I believe that when he saves you, he saves you. And it's forever. Now what's the attitude to be considered? Joy. All joy. The joy spoken of here is un, it's qualified by a little word, all. And it means complete and unmixed joy, a pure joy, a total joy, and it's not a make-believe joy. It used to slay me. The kids in, in Bible school would walk around going, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And I didn't feel like praising the Lord sometimes. And they were just always so glib about it. It's not fake. We're not talking about that kind of a joy. Put a smile on your face even though you're really busted up inside. It may be that James intended the all joy to balance the phrase various trials so that the various trials have their counterpart in every kind of joy. And you rejoice in the fact that you're facing various trials, different kinds of trials, because you get to experience joy in that new kind of trial. It's called the Christian life. <laughs> now let me show you just a few instances in the Bible where God's people were in various trials, but they were graced with every kind of joy because it is possible in Acts 5, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. The early apostles suffered beatings because they preached Jesus Christ, and they considered it something to be rejoicing in. Acts 16, 25, but about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying, singing hymns of praise to God in the inner prison in stocks. You remember that. We just got done studying the book of, of Philippians. And they were rejoicing. You think that was not an incredible testimony to the prisoners that could hear them singing? In Hebrews 12, too, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross and despising the shame, and he has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That kind of joy. So those instances show that the joy is not to be taken of as a light, frivolous hilarity, but rather a deep-seated conviction and confidence that God knows what he's about. He knows what he's doing in our lives. It's kind of childish, but it works. I try to imagine God in heaven biting his nails when I'm suffering anxiety, right, or, or something's coming. And I, I really do. I try to find a way to even consider that God would be alarmed like I am. And that's just my way of having confidence and showing confidence that God knows what he's doing and he's not biting his nails over my problems. Theodore Epp once wrote, all discipline for the moment seems that it's not joyful, taking it from Hebrews 12, 11. And so that confidence that God knows what he is doing and that the results will be for his glory and our good is something that we should hold on to. If you need to, write it in the front of your Bible. And when you suffer, go to the front of your Bible and read it and cross-reference it with Hebrews 12, 11. It all comes down to our attitude when we face trials. One man put it like this, our values determine our evaluation. Our values determine our evaluation. If we value comfort more than character, well, then trials will upset us. If we, if we value the material and physical more than the spiritual, 
we'll not be able to count it all joy. And if we live only for the present and forget about the future, the trials will make us bitter, not better. I like that. Bitter, not better. Remember Jesus' command to consider it all joy. All joy. Trials are not a possibility, but they're a certainty, okay? I started out the sermon talking to you about that. You will face trials in your life. When, that little word when, okay? When we face these kind of things, it's not if. The grammar shows that the word speaks of a certainty of trials that believers will face in their Christian lives. And and the Greek word behind the English word when carries the idea that it can be whenever. They come up suddenly. You're not anticipating them. In fact, you can't even predict that they're coming. They roll over you. Boom. And that's seen when you encounter. That word encounter means to fall into something. (laughs) It's used over in Luke 10.30 when the Good Samaritan finds one who fell among robbers. That's the word encounter. He encountered robbers. And there are various trials, meaning diverse, multifaceted, many different kinds. The trials come from every kind of source and can be of every conceivable kind, type, health, wealth, possessions, stress, family, relationships, disappointment, fear, job, mortgage, you name it, car troubles, Teacher troubles if you're in school. Parent troubles if you're a kid. (laughs) Troubles, trials, temptations, right? Various trials. They're so diverse. They can be physical. They can be mental. They can be spiritual. James is just trying to say it's all inclusive. These trials of your faith can come from any area, and they come suddenly. All trials, whether external or internal, eventually enter into our inner world as we consider the trial and begin to respond to it. And here's where trial touches our faith. It is our attitude toward it and then our response to it that reflect our spiritual condition, whether our faith is alive and vibrant or dead and useless. A mere profession of words. Trials will come. They're guaranteed to come to every believer's life. One verse, uh, 1 Peter 4.12, was a real help to me uh, early on in my Christian experience. It says, Beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery trial. And every one of them seemed like fiery trials to me at the time. (laughs) I was just a young Christian, and they just like, bam, right in your face, and You thought, I'm saved, I'm supposed to be okay. And you're learning and you're growing in your early years as a Christian. So don't be surprised at the fiery trial when it it comes upon you to test you. There it is, testing again, right? As though something strange were happening to you. This was such a rebuke to me in, in my early years of Christianity because I did. I considered it strange. Why am I suffering like this? I love the Lord. I'm going to Bible school. I want to be a missionary. (laughs) You know, I remember one guy got a flat tire on the way to church, and he was a doctor, and he was on call, and he usually didn't go to church when he was on call, and he thought, I'm going to go to church even though I'm on call. I think I can make it back in time. Had a beeper back in those days, and he got a flat tire. And I remember him talking in Sunday school. He came late, of course. And he said, why would God give me a flat tire when I'm coming to church. I hardly ever come to church when I'm on call, and I finally decide to come to church when I'm on call, and I get a flat tire. What's up with that? Wow. He didn't understand James chapter 1, did he? It says, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. So you have an eternal perspective rather than a temporal perspective. So trials will come. And remember, it's a command to consider these things with joy. 
and that they're certain, not potential. And, and then thirdly, the right attitude is based in a personal knowledge of the truth. There's conviction, right? There's conviction that undergirds this knowing. This knowledge fits perfectly with the command James has given to consider it all joy. He says, consider it all joy, my brethren, verse 2, when you encounter various trials, knowing, knowing something. And it's, it's another command. It's based on our personal knowledge that the testing of our faith is going to produce endurance. So as difficult as the trial may be, you look at the outcome of it, not the trial itself, and moan and groan about that, but you look at what it's going to build into your life, which is endurance. And that knowledge increases, as does the ability to endure such trials. The word used for knowing is a knowledge grounded in personal experience, not just an intellectual knowing. It's, I've been there. I've done this before. I used to laugh and say, just about the time you get victory over one area in your life, Poop, up pops the next one. You get victory over that, poop, up pops the next one. Now, you Christians that have been Christians for a while out there, when's the last time you've identified something that popped up? Because we begin to float, kind of like the middle age of Christendom in the personal life, right? We know all the nomenclature. We've got all the words. We know how to put on a nice face on Sunday and everything, and Everything's hunky-dory, but when's the last time you're really challenged with something that you're failing in terribly, and God is putting his finger on it, and you're dealing with it, and you're struggling with it, and your faith is being tested, and you've had to consider it all joy, because you know that it's going to work endurance in your life, and you're going to grow by it, so you just submit yourself to the test. That's what we need to do. That's how we grow You see, testing something in order to prove or disprove its genuineness or validity is why God brings these tests into our lives. So the trials are actually the agents that will test our faith and and reveal that it's true in its nature. The trials tend to purge and purify our faith. and, And one man said this, affliction lets down a blazing torch for the believer, into the depths of his own nature. And he sees many things which he little expected to see. Like that morning when I woke up and didn't sense God's presence with me anymore. He finds his faith to be weak, where he thought it was strong. And his views are dim, where he thought them clear. I'll be honest with you, some mornings, Sunday morning, I get up real early because I like to go over my sermon and pray over it and things and just get myself prepared. And sometimes I'm just praying by faith. (laughs) I'm serious. There ain't no feeling. I'm going, oh, Lord, (laughs) oh, Lord. Reminds me of Spurgeon. He'd come down Saturday night and tell his his wife, wifey, pray. (laughs) Pray. Because Saturday night had come, she called him for dinner, and he wasn't ready for his sermon. Pray, wifey, pray. Sometimes I feel like that early Sunday morning. But you know what? As I begin to pray and I begin to go over what I've prepared um, throughout the week, he begins to stir that up in me. And by the time that I come to the pulpit, I'm all excited to deliver to you the things that God gave to me throughout the week for you and for me. So those emotions can really get in the way of our faith. And then it says, of your faith. The crux of the matter, the theme of the book, it's all about genuine, living, vibrant, and quantifiable faith. After we've endured the testing of our faith, obeying the command of James to count it all joy, or consider it all joy, we come out the other side and discover that our trust in the Lord is not only intact, but that it is all the stronger for the testing that we just went through. Let me give you an example of how this works in just life, okay? It's an Old Testament uh, illustration, and the man is David, and David's a young man, and he's out watching his father's sheep, 
He's a shepherd and a bear and a lion come up. And he defeats the bear and the lion by faith. By faith. We know this because when he went up against Goliath, much bigger and more intimidating than a bear and a lion, he says, I will slay you even as I slayed the bear and the lion by faith. Faith grows, and he is able to go up against Goliath. Because faith, when it's tested and you come through it, it produces endurance patiently enduring trials with a proper attitude while trusting the Lord develops endurance, which is a lasting quality. It lasts. We read about that in Romans chapter 5, 3 through 5. It does something to us. It develops character in us, and it gives us hope. This shows not only a living faith, but also a triumphant faith tested in the crucible of persecution and trial, and Paul lauds the faith of the Thessalonians who exhibited such faith. The opposite of considering the various trials with all joy and the result being a strength and ability to endure could be failing to count them with all joy by complaining, by whining, by having an expectant attitude that you shouldn't be suffering this thing like my friend who got the flat tire on the way to church. How could God do such a thing? Buckling under the trials, moping, complaining, grumbling at the trial, leaving nothing and learning nothing and not growing in the ability to endure. We can't be weaklings, not in the days that we're coming into, folks. You've got to let God test your faith. You've got to know that you have confidence in the one that called you out of darkness into light, that gave you life when you were once dead. And if you don't have that confidence right now, maybe you need to check and see if you understand clearly the gospel. We're studying in the book of 1 Thessalonians for our men's and women's Bible study, and and at the end of it, it says that the Thessalonians turned from idols to a living God, true God, to serve and to wait. What's one of the sayings we have at this church? We've been saved to serve. It's biblical. Are you doing that? you will have so much more joy in your Christian life if you serve as you wait for the return of Jesus Christ. And part of that getting to the point where you serve is letting God test your faith, being confident, counting it all joy, and moving past the testing to where you're gaining endurance and you're beginning to mature in the Christian faith. Now I want to talk just a little bit about the part of prayer in trials. But if any of you lacks wisdom, verse 5, let him ask of God. The first thing that you need to understand is the need that you have for wisdom. It says, but. But. It starts with a contrast. The contrast in this discourse on prayer, and it brings it back to the previous discussions. It's comparing something, okay? And the link-up is for the believer who is unable to look and receive the trial of his faith in the way it was defined. Look at verse 4. And let endurance have its perfect results so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And in verse 6, but he must ask in faith. If you ask for wisdom and you don't ask in faith and you're double-minded, and I'll get to that in a moment, there's a contrast going on here because we fail sometimes in trusting God in the testing of our faith. And so if we're unable to look and receive the trial of our faith in the way just defined with an attitude full of joy, the first step in gaining wisdom is a conscious recognition of our need for it. Humble yourself 
and ask God for wisdom. I don't know which end is up. Do you ever pray like that to God? Do you ever just be really honest with him that you're just utterly confused? I don't know which way to go here. I don't know what decision to make. Help. Give me wisdom. That's all it's saying. James is going to tell us how we can be obedient to the command to assume that attitude when facing trials, even when we feel inadequate or unable to do so. We need wisdom, so say it in prayer. Now, definition of wisdom, you have a Hebrew understanding of wisdom and a Greek understanding of wisdom. The Greek understanding of wisdom was more intellectual, and it taught that if a person possessed perfect knowledge, that he could live the good life. Plato taught that. But the Hebrew worldview focused more on a realm of practical matters and the will, which was to be subject to divine guidance. Hebrew wisdom was practical, not speculative. And it was based on revealed principles of right and wrong and how those principles were applied to daily life. James was using a Hebrew mindset. He's writing to Jewish Christians early on. And so that, that mindset is a Hebrew mindset of wisdom, one that is practically outworked in the life. Proverbs 3, 5 through 7, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and don't lean to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Love it. That's a mainstay. If you're going to get a tattoo, get that tattoo right here. So you remind yourself every morning when you look in the mirror. A good definition of the word wisdom could be being skilled in the art of godly living. To accomplish a skill of daily living through the application of the knowledge that you have gained from the word of God the application of the knowledge that you have gained through the Word of God, meaning that you take the Word of God and you apply it to your life and then you live it out. Sometimes people just take in and take in and take in and take in and they don't give out. That's not a good thing. Paul says that knowledge puffs up, makes us proud. Biblical wisdom is a wisdom that takes in, sees how it applies to their life, and then they apply it to the everyday life that they live. That's biblical wisdom. Our wisdom begins with the fear of God, obviously, Proverbs 9.10. He's the source of all wisdom, according to Job 28.12. And we find completeness only through a personal relationship with Christ, who has become the wisdom of God for us, according to 1 Corinthians 1.30. Jesus is our wisdom. I loved uh, Brad Boozer when he was talking about lists. God isn't the first on your list. God is the list. <laughs> I like that a lot. It's really true. Jesus is our wisdom. We don't look in other places. Secondly, once we admit our need, we must remember and understand how to ask God for it, the way to request wisdom from God, but let him ask in faith, in faith, without doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind, for let not that man expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways." Let him ask. Well, there you go. Once again, it's a command. It seems softened by that little word let, but when you know that it's a Greek imperative, you know that it is a command. It's not an option for believers. When he lacks wisdom, it's his duty to ask God for it. This is another mark of the believer responding to the testing of their faith in a right way. Prayer is a display of dependence upon God. Prayerlessness is a surefire way of saying you're living under your own understanding. You're no longer in dependent relationship with God. You're figuring everything out for yourself. 
leaning on your own understanding. When you pray, you're turning things over to him. You're showing him dependence upon him. And you pray in faith without doubting, sincerely and believing that God will answer your prayer. You don't see how because you just came to him and said, I I can't figure up from down, left from right. I don't know what I'm supposed to do because that's the state you're in. But in your heart of hearts, you believe by going to God and telling him that, he'll make it right. He'll set it straight. You don't know how. And you surely don't feel like it right now. But you're praying to him with all your heart. He will find him. When you approach God sincerely, you will always find him. He will always respond. Jeremiah 29 11 through 13, he says, And I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. You can't fake this stuff. You can't. Second Chronicles 16, 9, For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the whole earth that he may strongly support. Isn't that what you want? You want God to strongly support you? That he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. You've been humbled. You're sincerely going to him and asking him for help, for wisdom, and you believe that he will answer because that's his nature. Draw near to God, it says in James 4, 8, and he will draw near to you. In Hebrews eleven six, 6, without faith, it's impossible to please God for he comes, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he will be a rewarder of those who seek him. But it's in sincerity, right? So the believer needs to recalibrate his thinking. The believer whose faith is being tested must focus his intention on God, on his person, on his character, and turn away from the test and the circumstances. We get really zeroed and laser focused on the trial that we're facing. And what James is telling us is get your eyes off of that and put it on God. And his word and the truth of his word, recalibrate your thinking and do it sincerely. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea driven and tossed by the wind, being double-minded, unstable in all his ways. You know, sometimes when we think of the sea and the ocean, we think of those waves rolling in consistently one after the other. You know, there, there's a symmetry to it, almost, you know, soothing to look at. That's not what... James is talking about here, not even close. Like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed. It's a picture of the surf where the wave breaks and the water broils and foams, and and there the water churns as if one man put it. It's a four-dimensional instability. I like that. A four-dimensional instability. The soul is like a piece of driftwood that's caught in the surf and it's turning over and over and over. And first it's being driven forward and then it's being driven back and then down to the bottom and then up again, shot to the surface and twisted around again and once again out towards shore. It's a picture of turmoil and instability. Have you been there? I certainly have. I certainly have. And it's when I'm really focused on the, on the testing. And it, I'm just going crazy. And then I'm reminded, look at not the test, but God. Because a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. John Bunyan referred to this man as, as Mr. Facing Both Ways <laughs> in the Pilgrim's Progress, right? Mr. Facing Both Ways. Double-minded is also, it's so often taught to be uh, like double-souled. You're divided. Part of you thinks it might happen. Part of you thinks maybe it won't. What am I going to do if it doesn't? Then pretty soon we're down that trail. Fretting, worrying. It's an apt picture of one who believes this and then believes that, or one whose focus is this way, but then tomorrow it's that way. It's one who goes in one direction and then in another, or says this, and then he does that. Unstable. That's not the picture that God would have a Christian to cast. It's not one who's walking in faith, for sure. And in fact, it's not the picture of a believer who's filled and led by the Holy Spirit because one of the fruit of the Spirit is peace. 
The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and patience. In Philippians 4, 6 through 7, which we just studied a few months back, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God. The peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And over in Isaiah 26, 3 through 4, the steadfast of mine, thou will keep in perfect peace because he trusts in thee. Peace. You can't be unstable and be at peace and be at rest, trusting God. No matter what the test, when a person reacts to the trial by praying with double-mindedness, the active ingredient missing from their lives is faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. And with a life characterized by doubting, that person should not expect that they'll receive anything from the Lord. Wow, James is harsh. (laughs) He just lays it out. He is so blunt, but so practical. So recognizing the need for wisdom, we humble ourselves and we sincerely then pray for the wisdom from God. And finally, we, we need that conviction. The gift of wisdom comes from God. If the double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, on the other hand, those who ask believing can be fully confident that God will give them the wisdom they so desperately need. Look back at verse 5. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given him. Wow. He gives to all men. This is the very nature of God. It's taught in so many places in the Bible, it's superfluous to even consider it. But look at Matthew 7, 7 through 8. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it shall be opened. It's, it's implied that you're doing this sincerely. And when you do it sincerely, God answers. Or Mark 11, 24, Therefore I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them, and they will be granted to you. And he gives this wisdom generously. Means without holding back. There's no tricks God does not hold back anything. His giving is in measure to the need that you come to him with. Because he's God. He not only has the capacity, but he has the will. He wants to do this for you. If the need is great, the generosity is great. If the need is smaller, the generosity conforms to the need that's prayed for. And this is my favorite part here. Okay? Okay? Without reproach. Oh, there's been so many times I've prayed, oh, don't blow on me, Lord, I'm just dust. Lead me in a straight path, Lord. Don't lead me in a bumpy one. Please, Lord, don't lead me with lots of twists and turns. Just keep it simple for me. Right? Don't rebuke me, Lord. I know I failed again. This is important to us when we often find ourselves feeling very uncomfortable, very small when coming before God in our deep need of help. In the world, we're aware of those who dispense help and assistance to the needy and the limitations of resources. A needy person in the context of the world is often tempted with the thought, if they ask too often or if they ask for too much, they'll be turned away. In Indonesia, I learned why people don't stand in lines. They all kind of crowd to get something. You know, here we're, we get in queues. We stand in lines and we wait our turn. Not in Indonesia. Do you know why? Because they know that it very well might be when they get to the top of the line, there won't be anything left. We don't really know that. We're starting to. The shelves are getting kind of bare in the stores these days. Supply lines are going kind of crazy. Maybe we'll start rushing the lines and not stand in line anymore. It's very interesting, but this is not the case with God. His giving isn't selective in that he gives to all men generously. And our asking is never with 
met with reproach. The word here for reproach means rejection. In, in other places in the Bible, it means to reprimand or to insult. And that's why I told you I liked it, because it doesn't make one feel small or insignificant when you go to God in sincerity and ask for wisdom because you're lacking it. He doesn't make fun of you because he loves you and he died for you and he wants to help you. And how often have we gone to help from somebody that just laughs at us, treats us as if we're not worth the time or the effort that it would take to help? God's not like that. God responds to our request for wisdom in our time of trial. God remains consistent with his character and lavishes his love and richness on anyone who entrusts his soul to his care. And James tells us God will give to all generously. It's the essence of his nature. And it's the central truth of the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And so he's going to withhold wisdom from you? He didn't withhold his son from you. Well, I'm done for this week, but next week we're going to look at temptation. And does God tempt us? And what is it about temptation? How do we deal with temptation? So you can be reading over James chapter 1 and coming up with your thoughts on that and then come prepared next week for that. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're a loving God and that you do know our frame is but dust and you don't blow on us because you love us, you care for us. You want us to succeed and even the testing of our faith is to prove that it's genuine. That's your intention. You want us to shine, kind of like Job, because God knew he was a righteous man, and he loved you with all of his heart, and he was sincere. And so you allowed him to be tested in a very, very serious way, and yet he came out on top because of you, because of your strengthening him, and because of the wisdom that you gave him in the end. We pray for that kind of wisdom, Lord, today. In Jesus' name, amen.